it needs to be more supplemental instead of reliable workforce. And, and we've just made that, that change in our business. Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, where we connect you with members of the beef industry who can help you build a more profitable operation. As you listen to each episode, be sure to set an intention for the show. What do you want to get out of it, and how do you want to use this information to make changes on your operation? If you're looking for more ranching resources outside of what's being shared on these podcast episodes, sign up for my free weekly newsletter. I'll send ranching information and podcast episodes straight to your inbox every week. In addition to that, you will also receive a free PDF with 22 ranch management tips from the gurus who have been on my show. The link to sign up for that is in the show notes. With that, let's hear from our guests today and discover how we can improve the beef industry and our own unique cattle operations. All right. Well, today I am here with Jamie Hag, and I guess I get to spend a lot more time talking to your daughter than I do you, but I am pretty excited to have you on the show today, Jamie. And we're going to, for those folks out there listening, we're going to talk about Jamie's experience and his farm and ranch's experience using the H2A program, because we're going to spend some time talking about labor challenges and this month's content. So before we dive into Jamie's experience there. Jamie, would you please introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what your operation looks like today and where you're located so that the listeners kind of get a feel for where you're at? Sure. Um, We we live at Carson, North Dakota. We, uh, We have a partnership between my brother's family and my family. Um, my wife, Deb, and we have three children, JC, which works for Nebraska Cattlemen's Association. And then we have two kids in school, high school still, uh, Grant and Hayden, um, our two boys. And Claire, Claire's family, um, him and Jennifer, they have four kids, um, a senior in high school, um, two kids in high school, and, the, and, and uh, their twins are, are in sixth grade. So that's a little bit about our families. Um, our, our place has been in, in our, was a homestead in 1906, served by my great grandfather, came over from Norway. Um, we're a diversified operation. My brother takes care of the farming side of our business, along with um, the marketing side. I take care of the cattle, the, the cow calf side, the registered cattle and, and the feedlot. Um, my sister-in-law, which um, she takes care of our books and, and she's also an attorney. So, which comes in handy when we start talking about H2A stuff and visas and, and government policy, because it seems like it's gotten to be where you almost need an attorney in the family to, to make sure your, your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed, or they're just going to throw it at the bottom of the pile. Well, you have a lot of things going on. You have a lot of people running around on your place. So that's pretty cool to see a family operation like that. Did you say 1906 was the homestead year? Right. Yeah. That's been in the family for a long time. Good for you guys. So what kind of drove you to start looking into the H2A program? What were you experiencing where you thought that this would be like the next step for you guys to try this program because you needed help. So before, before Claire and I came home, my, my father, Jim has lots of what we'd call horror stories of, of labor. And, um, but he always had, you know, from a young age growing up, we always had employees uh, we normally had um, a family or two on the place, and but it was it was that seasonal help that we were really lacking, and um, we I don't remember how we heard about it, but it, it was about 17 years ago when we started with our first H2A, and um, and it's kind of gone from there. 
So, okay. So you said 17 years ago is when you started. So what advice do you have for those who are just thinking about getting into the program if they haven't, if they haven't experienced this yet and they're just thinking about it? What questions do they kind of need to ask themselves to see if they need to take the next steps into exploring this program? Well, the H2A program has changed a lot over the years. You know, when we first started the program, I think there was a lot more leniency where we could, we could, we could have a visa, we could use them on the cropping enterprise, we could float them over to the cow-calf enterprise, and it, it worked fairly smoothly. Um, now, the law could have been in fact at that time that you couldn't cross over, but today it's it's they kind of tie your hands they really don't care for the for the cow side of the business um it's more tailored to seasonal operations such as grain farming or in our case our feedlot operation is seasonal now getting back to your question at hand um someone that wants to start in it find a good agency um there's many agencies out there um, we've rolled through, I think, three of them over, over the years. Um, the second, the first one was actually, I don't want to call it a sham, but it was a sham. They were bringing people over when we were so new to the program, they were bringing people over and their visas, when we would get them, wouldn't even have our name on the visa, it'd be someone else's name. And I, I think they, they, they're no longer, and I think they did I think the federal government took care of that, but um, we use U.S. Farm Labor now. Um, I they've been good to work with. Uh, Claire does most of our visa, and Jen do most of our visa. The processing side, there's a lot of details that go into it. They need a lot of information about the operation. Um, the agency is going to help you write what what you want them to be doing because you have to kind of have it written down are they going to be driving tractors are they going to be driving trucks are they going to be driving um if they're a feedlot are they going to be driving um a feed wagon you you got to have some mechanical stuff in there because every operation no matter what you're you're working on things so you got to make sure that's in there um it's uh like I said, the agency, you have to have a house for them to live in. Um, housing is a big part of it. You know, you need to know what your, the government sets, what you pay these people. And um, it's no longer cheap labor. You pay their plane tickets from wherever they're coming from. It's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes that people don't realize. So, you know, you brought up that it's changed a lot and that you mostly use it on the farming side of your operation because it works a little better there for the seasonal work. Is that because of some of the government restrictions or just because of the seasonality of farming and ranching? Like, why is it working better for your farming side better than the cattle side for you? So, in my opinion, they, they, the government can distinguish that you put a crop in the ground and you harvest a crop and that, and that is, is the season. What they don't realize in farming is that you also haul grain to town, you work on equipment all winter, you do all those things that can, you can consider it a year round employment option, mm -hmm. Just like in a cow calf business, you know, there's seasonal work there, there's calving, there's putting up hay, there's weaning, there's feeding those calves. There, there, you could pick a season there, but they, they really don't like the words calving in an application. So with that being said, on our operation, we, we have our summer H2As, um, they don't even see a cow because um and 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 then we end up on our busy days end up taking our full-time employees that might be in the in the cropping operation and they may help work cattle for a day but the, there's there's a pretty rigid line that they follow there um, 
in my opinion, they need, the government needs to quit fighting about the egg side and they need to come up with a viable visa system that works um, instead of instead of just allowing uh, we I, I know people that use illegals and um, it you know it's it's either you do this or you or you go to the other side and 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 we've chosen for for this generation anyway to 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 use the visa programs and stay with what we're doing but it 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 gets difficult at times if you uh, if a visa gets held up or a piece of paperwork isn't right and 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 you're going to the field normally where we live we're planting by the middle of March and uh, so we want them here by the first of March to kind of get their feet on the ground or to the end of February mm -hmm. and uh, you get a hiccup or two, which has happened quite a few times in the last 15 years, and uh, you put the crop in without them. So how how long are they on your farm working? What's that time span look like? Because they're not there year round. How many months out of the year are they working for you? Um, normally it's nine to 10 months where they're, they're here on the operation. Um, we've, and we've we've had employ we we don't call them visas or they, we call them employees just like mm -hmm. the rest they're human beings and and uh, and we treat them just like you'd want to be treated or any other person but um we've 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 had I call it the blessing to have people from all over the world working at this place because you learn you make friends for life especially in my younger years when i was in my upper 20s until about 40 you know you're similar age to a lot of these young men and women and you build you build friendships and i i see my kids now and my nieces building friendships with these young people and and you you start to realize that we're such a small sliver of what's really going on in the world. Well, that's really neat. Hey folks, I've got a quick question for you. Do you know the magical feeling that comes when things just work out? Like when the vet says all your cows are bred? Don't you wish you could feel that more often? Well, I'm here to tell you you can by using Cattle ID. With Cattle ID, you can store, share, and collaborate on your herd records from your mobile device. Yes, I said collaborate because multiple people on your operation can analyze and access this information at one time. So you can say goodbye to the back and forth miscommunication and misplaced records. And that's not all. Cattle ID also serves up actionable analytics to help you and your team make smarter, more informed decisions for your ranch. So let Cattle ID take some of the burden off of your shoulders and make ranching easier. You can get started online and learn more about Cattle ID by going to cattleidapp.com. And that link will also be in the show notes. You brought up housing. Yep. And is that a big challenge? Like what is it? Do they need a completely separate unit? What does it look like to provide housing? for people in this program? So on the H2A program, you have to, um, you could put two, two beds in a bedroom. It depends on square footage of the size of the bedroom. It's inspected yearly. Um, and um, job service does that. Um, someone comes out and inspects, takes a water sample, um, make make sure everything's up up to par. Um, we actually have housing on our place. We we have two homes. Um, one is a four bedroom. One is a five bedroom. And we're actually building an apartment style four bedroom type type deal as well so we have more beds um, have more options everyone wants their own bedroom so they can so they can get away it 
uh, from a society standpoint, it's changed a lot. You know, I would say the first 10 years we did it, uh, these young men and women, they would cook together, they would go out together, they would barbecue together, everything was social. Now you find more of them that when they get in at night, you'll have some real introverts that just go to their room, get on their, get on their device, call home to their friends, they're talking in their native language, which makes it really hard if, uh, especially if they're like from Brazil or the Ukraine, where English is not second nature to them. They, they don't pick up the language as fast and it's actually a detriment to them. So have you had, has the language barrier been a bit of an issue in the past few years or for the most part, have they been able to understand enough English where, you know, workflow has still been efficient and there haven't been too many misunderstandings? <laughs> for the most part, we've been fairly fortunate we vet the English side very hard, you know, because you're going to have, and, and we could go, through, so in North Dakota, I think the, the wage just went up to 1735 or 1788. So someone that's never been here, that's where they're going to start. Plus you have a plane ticket, plus you have all the fees of the agency, plus you have the housing fees, you know, pretty soon you're in the in the 20s, somewhere in the 20s, floating with them uh, per hour. And if you have a lot of English barrier, you're not gonna get out of them what you really need to get out of them to make it feasible for the operation. Yeah, that's a very good point. And that, I didn't realize though, that's kind of what expenses looked like as far as hiring labor through this program. So that's good to know. Now, so you, What's nice when you have employees is that if they're there year over year and they know how things run, it helps you as a manager because you know they understand you don't have to constantly retrain. Do you have the ability to get some of the same people back year after year or are you kind of um, at the mercy of who's ever in charge of the program? So, and, and maybe we should have started with this, you know, I would say the first 10 years we were doing the program, we had one full-time person and we were probably running four to six visas on the place, which made it very difficult. But I take that back. We, we, had, we had a couple of gentlemen I can think of, one from South Africa was here on, on five roles, uh, a couple of Ukrainians that were here between four and six roles. So you really, you really start to, you can really count on those people year after year. We've actually switched our operation. A couple of years ago, we, we made a conscious effort that we were gonna make changes. And our changes were, we were gonna start looking and hiring some middle management labor, um, people that can, can take, the task of the day and go do it um, on the on the cattle side of the operation. It's worked really well. I have a great team. In fact, I I don't on the feedlot right now. We have a couple couple visas, but on the cow calf side, um, everyone has been through at least two calvings here, and our one gal has been through four calvings. So we, we look at it as it needs to be more supplemental instead of reliable workforce. And, and we've just made that, that change in our business. Um, we're still working on that, on, on the grain farming. Um, we've actually recently hired a full-time mechanic, which is gonna take a ton of pressure off Claire and me for that matter, because no matter which side of the operation, things still roll through that shop. And, and, and if we can have one person that that's their concentration, that's gonna help us a lot. Yeah, they're, uh, 
it's usually well worth either hiring or finding a good mechanic because uh, really farmers and ranchers don't have a lot of time to do it themselves. And if it's not their area of expertise, it's going to take even more time to figure it out. At least that's how I feel like it is on our operation. But yeah, Claire's pretty good at it. And if I can't fix it with a hammer and a welder, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> so I guess Another question, not necessarily H2A related, but just when it comes to managing employees in general, what are some effective methods of communication that you've found to try and keep everyone on the same page? Like, how have you learned over, you know, the past 17 years to be an effective communicator and leader with your employees? Well, I could probably tell you everything that I do wrong. (laughs) (laughs) My brother, Claire, and I have completely different management styles. Uh, He's way more laid back. I'm more, well, I used to be, I would consider myself living on the edge all the time, needing it to be done. And I still like things done right. I'm very old school. um, But it, it's changed. I mean, uh, the people we have now are so talented that we need to keep giving them more responsibility because if we don't, they're going to leave. And, and I think you need to make them part of, part of your family. It's um, for Deb and I, it's, you know, our big thing is, is Sunday, our church is so important to us, and and we have on any given Sunday between one and three of our employees sit next to us in church, and and that's really important. That's great to hear. So as we kind of wrap up today, Jamie, overall, you know, are you what would be the main benefits of the H two A program? Would you say it's still worth it to look into for some people? What's kind of your overall view of the program since you've been in it for 17 years and have seen how it's progressed? So, so I'll start with probably, I'll go back to the fact, um, I do believe that there's a spot for it. Um, and, and I, uh, you and I have talked about there. There's there's people in North Dakota that are making this work on their cattle operations, and uh, they've made it work a little easier than than we have. Um, I I think the government really needs to look at changing production agriculture for for the beef industry, the dairy industry, and the swine industry. They they need a different visa. They, they truly do. And they need to make it a three to five year type visa where you can get people, you can train them. Um, maybe they don't need quite the skill set when they come in, but you can train them into being someone that after six months to a year, you can really rely on them and then have a couple of years to regain that, that cost out of them um, from that standpoint. But the, the government is it is highly regulated. So you got to realize, you know, kind of what's your, the risk to reward, I guess. Well, thank you very much for your honest conversation today and sharing your thoughts and experience about the H2A program for everyone out there listening to the podcast. Well, thank you. Hey folks, it's Shay here, and I want to personally invite you as my listener to take the next steps in improving the profitability of your operation by signing up for my 2023 Rancher Mind series. The Rancher Mind program consists of producer-driven monthly calls that cover topics such as developing a reproduction program, labor challenges, cattle marketing, business development, and goal setting. I bring on industry experts each month to answer your specific questions. I also provide extra resources and a place for you to keep networking and moving forward without requiring you to leave the ranch. For more information, head over to my website, casualcattleconversations.com, and select the Rancher Mind event tab. Let's keep moving individual operations and our industry forward. And 
that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.